Bienvenue à l'Alliance Française du Chicago. My name is Mary Ellen Canellan, and I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance, an organization turning 125 years old this year. We will be celebrating this milestone with our gala 125 Le Bal on May 7th at the Four Seasons Hotel. It promises to be a very chic affair. And if you'd like to learn more about it, please go to our website. We'd love to see you there. But today, we are so happy to have all of you with us to get an update on the restoration of our beloved Notre Dame de Paris. And to do so, we welcome back our dear friend, Michel Picot, who was last with us at our An Air de Provence Gala in November 2020. Michel Picot is the president of Friends of Notre Dame de Paris, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to raising funds to accelerate the restoration of the iconic Paris Cathedral, a position that he has held since its incorporation hmm. October 2016. But he has a distinguished resume beyond that. He has served as COO for international markets of the Demos Group, one of the main European learning and development companies, and has been president and CEO of HR Access Solutions, a leading human resources software provider, part of Fidelity Investments. He was also the senior VP for Orange Business Services, Equant, the CEO of Alcatel Réseau d'Entreprise, and he worked for Bosch Telephone Group in France and in Germany. He is a graduate of the École Polytechnique Paris, Mine Paris Tech, and Telecom Paris Tech. And in his spare time, he is married and is the proud father of four sons and two daughters and the grandfather of one granddaughter. Michel will be in conversation with our very own Chicago-based architect and photographer, Tom Rossiter who has also been supporting the restoration thanks to his Architecture Revealed initiative. And now, à vous, Tom. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen. And it's great to be with all of you on one of my favorite topics. Um, always fun for me uh, to be with Michelle. Uh, what a privilege. Uh, I'll tell you a little background I have been working on a series of uh, photographs uh, on great buildings of the world. And I had done a photograph of Notre Dame because uh, it needs no further introduction to this group. Uh, when the cathedral burned, I think all of us know where we were. I happen to be in uh, at Exeter Academy photographing uh, Louis Kahn's great library there. And we were stunned as so many were and uh, just horrified <clears throat> and wanted to do whatever we could. My partner, Natalie is French and wanted, and I asked her find out uh, who we can contribute to, find out how we help. And so she did um, some research and came to uh, Michelle, uh, because what I was going to do is make an addition of the photograph I had made and donate it and all the proceeds would go uh, to an organization. And I just wanted to make absolutely sure that that was the, that we were making the right choice. As it turned out, Michelle was coming to Chicago two weeks yeah. hence. Uh, and so we put a program together and uh, we uh, had uh, great participation, and uh, we were able to raise some money. And the best part of it is that uh, I uh, gained a new friend uh, with Michelle and Andre Finot um, from uh, the cathedral itself. So, uh, Michelle, do you have a rebuttal? Uh, I think this, I gained also a very good friend when we met first in uh, Chicago, and I thank you very much for that because your immediate support after the fire for us was a great uh, encouragement for, for the next steps. So uh, 
I think I'll share the screen. And let's get to play slideshow. And let's go back. <clears throat> so I'm going to walk quickly. All of us know this, this iconic before picture. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, I've been doing in at the Ecole de Bazaar, they had a technique called analytique where they on a single drawing would take and put uh, the inside, the outside and key details of the building so that people could understand that um, what, what, what the building was about in a single image. So here are some of the images I took that comprised the final building. What you're seeing here is the rose window as it appears with the organ in front of it. And then my idealized version uh, that goes into the final image. Here you're seeing a detail up close of the base of the building where it's been cut open and some of the sculptures exposed. Um, and then here you're seeing a final image where there's a sea of people uh, that were a river that's been coming for 800 years. The sky has been replaced with a sky that was from a full moon night. And now when you look at the outside of the building, you see the rose window as if you were looking at the light of God from the inside looking out. And so this is the image that we printed to raise uh, funds with. And so now that brings us to the fire and the reason that we're here. And uh, I think we'd all like to know, Michelle, where were you uh, when this was yeah. happening? And can you, can you give some of the quality of what that was like that day? Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually I had started um, a few years before the fire, as, as you said, and, the, and you have seen uh, the, the picture of the cathedral before the fire a little bit earlier. Actually, what you need to know is that the, the cathedral was already in a very dire state before the fire. And this is why we had started this program of restoring the cathedral. And this is why, actually, when the fire happened, and you, you have some uh, pictures of the fire, there was this big uh, scaffolding uh, around the, uh, the spire of the cathedral. So actually, the day, the day of the fire, I had worked uh, at the cathedral uh, all along the day, and I, and I had come back home uh, in, uh, in saint germain en laye where I live, a few kilometers from Paris. So I was evidently completely shocked when I got the news of the fire itself. And uh, I came back uh, at the beginning of, of the night to, to the square of the cathedral. And, and this was for me evidently a, a, terrible, uh, a terrible situation to leave actually what was taking place um, uh, in, the, in the cathedral, around the cathedral, with the firefighters uh, fighting to extinguish this fire. You know that this was a, a very long night, and that the, uh, the fire, which had started actually at the bottom of the cathedral, so at the level of the choir, with a very strong uh, east wind, uh, pushed the fire actually uh, towards the towers of the cathedral, and we had a, we had a terrible, uh, terrible moment uh, the beginning of the night when the fire began to touch the, the wooden belfry of the north tower of the cathedral that you see here uh, on the, uh, I would say, the right hand side of the picture. And fortunately enough, I would say the, uh, the, the firefighter succeeded to stop the, the fire of this uh, belfry of the north tower and progressively I would say, and this is what you see was the situation the day after the fire, progressively uh, they succeeded to, to e extinguish the fire. So this was really a terrible night. There was, between us, there was also, and you see also uh, another view here of the state of the cathedral after the fire. We had also a very, uh, I would say, decisive moment in the night because we, uh, we, the, the, the team of the cathedral wanted to save uh, the maximum of uh, artworks in the cathedral, and especially 
to save the, the crown of thorns, which was kept in a safe at the bottom of the choir of the cathedral. And the, um, the guy in charge, actually, of uh, salvaging this crown of thorns, so he didn't remember immediately uh, the code to open the safe for getting the crown of thorns, so he had to, to phone one of his colleagues. So, and, and in the end, we were able actually to save most of the artworks which were inside the cathedral. So it was really a terrible, terrible night and a terrible day for us. Uh, I think there was also a wonderful discovery uh, the following day of something that fell out in the plaza. Can you uh, share that story? Yeah, so this is, this is a story of the, uh, the rooster of the cathedral because uh, you know that what happened is that the spire evidently uh, completely burnt and, uh, and uh, collapsed in the middle of the cathedral. So where we see uh, here this, uh, these uh, uh, charred timbers in the middle of the cathedral. But on the, the top of the spire, there was a, a rooster, which actually was, uh, was uh, uh, projected outside the cathedral, and it was effectively discovered the following day. So this was effectively a, 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 a nice story in a way. And what happened also, there, there was a lot of, enfin, several miracles, I would say, during this night, because the, uh, there was also a very famous statue at the crossing of the transept of the cathedral, a uh, statue of what we call the, the Virgin of the Pillar, which was right uh, at an angle of, of this crossing of the transept. And this statue of the Virgin Ma Mary was uh, miraculously uh, uh, saved from uh, all the, uh, the timbers which uh, fell down from, uh, from the, the roof of the cathedral. So, so this was for us also something encouraging in, in the middle of this terrible uh, nightmare. So we've heard uh, some of the remarkable things that have happened. Is, is there something that's lost that really is a tragedy and that we should be aware of that you could share with us? Uh, yeah, I think the, what, what, what was lost evidently is all the upper part of the cathedral and especially what we uh, used to call the, the forest, which was the timber framework of the roof of the cathedral. Uh, so this was a, a timber framework made of about 2,000 two uh, oak trees and, um, and evidently completely burnt. So this is a, this is a terrible loss for us. The uh, part of it was from the Middle Ages. And part of it had been restored by Violet Le Duc in the 19th century, but every, everything was destroyed and burnt. The, uh, there, is, there is nonetheless a good news uh, among that uh, because Violet Le Duc, uh, which undertook the last uh, very large restoration of the cathedral in the middle of the 19th century, he had documented actually the, the whole cathedral and especially the, the roof of the cathedral with all these uh, pieces of wood uh, composing the, the, the roof of the cathedral. And so the decision was made uh, uh, mid-2020 uh, to, to uh, restore the cathedral as it was uh, in the morning of April 15, 2019. And with these documents of Yellow Le Duc, we will be able actually to rebuild completely this um, timber framework of the roof as it was uh, before the fire. So that's one of the good news. Here you see. Uh, another uh, picture, uh, which is a picture of the, uh, uh, the big uh, hall that we have uh, at the crossing of the transept where the spire stood. And, and you see here that the, um, the scaffoldings, the burnt scaffoldings um, has been, uh, I would say, retrieved progressively uh, in the following months after the fire. And this was a very, uh, a very sensitive uh, undertaking because uh, part of the stability of the building just after the fire and after the roof disappeared uh, was, uh, I would say, uh, due to this uh, burnt scaffolding, which uh, relied 
uh, on the different walls of uh, the nave, the choir, and the transept, and which stabilized actually the, the walls and avoided that in the following months after the fire, we had additional damages. So the, the removal of this uh, burn scaffolding was a very uh, delicate part of the first uh, months uh, after the fire. And, uh, and we succeeded in a way to uh, remove it uh, uh, while uh, maintaining the stability of, of the wall building, even, even if there was no roof anymore and, uh, and some big uh, holes also in the vaults of the building itself. One of the things that's intriguing to me as an architect, you think about uh, fire is a fairly common story in cathedrals. And in fact, the stone was meant to be the fire protection system. The uh, oak forest was not supposed to penetrate. So when the flesh fell and broke through the stone, it actually broke the fire barrier and allowed them the wood to fall in. But the thinking in medieval times was to create the stone as a fire protection from the wood burning through. So here we see that the failure from the flesh actually falling through the roof. Yeah, and, and actually there were, there were uh, three, three big holes in the vaults. So one at the crossing of the transept, <clears throat> one also um, in the nave, in the vaults of the nave because the, the spire actually fell uh, on the nave and, uh, and one also in the north transept because part of the, the oak trees uh, of the roof, I would say, penetrated and, and, and uh, cracked the, uh, the, the, the vaults of, of the north transept. So I wanted to give a little characterization of what it was like to go visit the cathedral. Uh, uh, Michel and uh, uh, Andre were kind enough to allow me to come through. So I arrived to this sign which says, uh, uh, public is obviously not allowed. Surveillance, uh, as I said earlier, you'll die if you come in here. Um, and what you're greeted with uh, in a conference room that's in a, uh, a uh, you know, metal building is uh, there's this packet with my name on it with a t-shirt, underwear, socks, and the jumpsuit. Uh, because of all of the lead on the roof, you're to remove all of your clothes, put them in a garbage bag, hand the garbage bag to someone and put this suit on. I was then told that I could only take what cameras I was willing to put in the garbage bag. So here you're seeing me entering the shower with the boots down on the floor, the garbage bags full of camera gear, a Canon lens there, and I'm about to take all of those clothes off, wash with the Louis Vuitton soap <laughs> there, and uh, re-put my clothes on and take my garbage bag full of camera gear out of there. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, that a bit, uh, yeah, yeah, Michel? Yeah. I will not. I will not talk about Louis Vuitton, but the, the reality <laughs> is that one of the problems that we had is that the uh, the covering of the roof and the covering of the spire was in lead, and so we had about three hundred tons of lead who uh, melted uh, during the fire and uh, contaminated actually the wall uh, the wall building, and this is one of the problems. We, we face and we have faced and we still face, which is that we have a very high level of lead contamination and that we need effectively to, to clean the wall building and to take uh, protective measures for the workers and for people inside the casket wall because of this lead contamination. And you see, for instance, on this picture in front of you, you see one of the workers inside the casket wall wearing this, uh, this protective uh, clothes. And, um, and this is also uh, an opportunity for me to, to, to tell you that after the first safety phase, uh, which uh, lasted until uh, mid-2021, so we have now got into a new phase, which is the preparation of the reconstruction of uh, the cathedral. And so we, we, in, we have installed these big scaffoldings, uh, this time inside the cathedral. 
and and these scaffoldings they will be used to uh, rebuild the the vaults themselves and also evidently uh, afterwards the roof and and the spire and so this is why you see this uh, very big uh, installation inside the cathedral and here you have uh, also this is another phase which is the phase of i would say removing completely uh, the um, the burnt scaffolding ex exterior scaffolding of the spire so you see all the equipment which were used for that and still uh, some uh, some burnt parts uh, at this at this level of of the crossing of the transept and you see also on the on the the bottom of the picture so you see this uh, umbrella what we call uh, an umbrella which is actually um, a, a, a removing uh, a roof uh, to protect the, uh, the the building and which allowed us actually to uh, completely uh, waterproof the building uh, after the after the safety phase and to be able effectively to to prepare the reconstruction works I think we will see also a picture with one of the uh, what we call the rope uh, rope access technicians that we call also the, the squirrels because you see they they are working uh, from uh, from cables to uh, they were working from cables to uh, to clean up the uh, the, the vaults uh, the ex what we call the extra door of the of the vaults and here you see um, an example of. Uh, the vaults. So here we are in uh, one of the two transepts, the north transept, and you see one of the big uh, holes that has been uh, caused by uh, by the burnt uh, timbers of of the uh, of the roof. And so all this is uh, to protect, not, not only to protect, but to prepare the reconstruction of of the vaults of the cathedral. We will see also uh, another example. We have we have installed what we call uh, hangers uh, below the vaults, and these uh, hangers, uh, these new hangers, they will allow us to uh, complement the vaults with the uh, missing uh, stones, and also That's to consolidate and to replace some of the stones which are too weak uh, for uh, the covering of the uh, the building. We can see probably also. Uh, I was going to ask you, what are we seeing? What is the metal that we're seeing there, Michelle? The, what, what's the purpose of this particular slide? Oh, you've been muted. So this, this, uh, this picture shows you how we will uh, consolidate and rebuild the vaults of the cathedral, and and you see that this big uh, wooden uh, hanger that you see here, they, they um, I would say they are exactly uh, I would say in the same place as uh, the ribs of of the vaults, and so this will allow us to replace the missing stones and also to complement the stones that are missing because of of the of the fire. I was told, uh, Michelle, that the uh, metal that we're seeing here in the center left of this picture is actually the remnants of the flesh itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that, that's, so that's, that's what we're looking at. This is yeah. where it actually attached uh, to the stone, and that's what we're seeing, the very bottom of that. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Here you have an overview, another view, uh, and you see that these uh, hangers they they are exactly in the in the form of the the, the ribs of the of the vaults, and um, and so they will they will stay in place until we consolidate the vaults and until we uh, we replace the uh, the missing uh, stones of the vaults, and so so this is another view uh, this time of of the of the nave, of the upper part of, of the nave. And, uh, and now everywhere inside the cathedral, you have this type of floors, which will uh, help us uh, rebuild the, the roof of the cathedral. Here, this is um, another example, which is interesting because we, in, in this first phase of the restoration of the cathedral, we, we tested the restoration techniques 
in uh, in two of the chapels of uh, of the uh, the cathedral, the um, chapel Saint Ferdinand in the uh, in the ambulatory of uh, the choir of the cathedral, and uh, the chapel uh, Notre Dame de Guadalupe, uh, which is one of the chapels of the aisles of the nave of the cathedral. And so you, you can see actually here how uh, these uh, paintings, these uh, stained glass windows, and these uh, statues will be restored and completely uh, cleaned up at the end of the restoration. So this is an example of these two test chapels, but everything will be done in the same way uh, in the course of the restoration. And, uh, and I'd like to point out that Michelle is modeling a new Louis Vuitton outfit there, complete with a face <laughs> mask and a hard hat. Exactly. So this is an example. We, we will also restore the uh, wonderful uh, stained glass windows of the cathedral, and especially the stained glass windows of the three uh, large rose windows. So this is a part of the uh, south uh, rose window. Um, you, there, is an, there is an organization in the cathedral, the South Rose Windows is mostly composed with scenes from the uh, New Testament. And so here you see the scene of uh, the Christ and the paralytic. Um, so this is a, an example. So this is before cleaning. And so this will be part also of the, the overall restoration program. And on the- So uh, uh, Michel, yeah. Uh, when you say that the uh, windows are restored, are they removed? Tell us a little bit about the process that uh, one goes through to make something look so magnificent as this. So these, these ones uh, will, not be will not be removed. So the, the, the stained glass windows of the three rose windows will be uh, cleaned up and restored uh, on site, so there will be no removal. Uh, so, so this one, for instance, will be uh, will be restored on site, which is not the case of the, um, the stained glass windows of the upper part of the nave, which have been all uh, removed and will be restored in uh, in workshops. But uh, the, the three large ones, they will be uh, restored on site, and uh, and and we have the opportunity of looking at them, uh, I would say, during the restoration from very close, so which is also very interesting for, I would say, the overall uh, history of these windows. And, um, and after, after that, you saw an example of one of the uh, large paintings uh, which were inside the cathedral. Uh, this is uh, what we call the maze of the cathedral. They were paintings offered by the, uh, the guide of the goldsmiths of Paris every year uh, in the 17th century to the chapter of the cathedral. And they were representing a scenes of the uh, uh, act of the apostles or uh, New Testament. And here you have the, um, uh, the example of the uh, May representing the conversion of uh, Saint Paul on his way to Damas. And so uh, this, this uh, very large painting of about three meters by four meters will be uh, restored, completely restored, and uh, will be again uh, presented uh, inside the cathedral after the, uh, the reopening of the cathedral. In what condition was it uh, before restoration began? This obviously looks like a fully restored painting. What was it like? Alors, only, only, uh, only a part of them had been uh, restored. So, so they have not suffered so much from the, uh, from the fire itself because they were in the chapels uh, uh, on, on the ground of the cathedral. So they, they suffered from uh, uh, lead uh, dust and uh, uh, fortunately not too much from uh, watering, but from lead dust. And so they will be fully restored um, for the reopening or after the reopening. So, this is also something very interesting. This is an example of also a very nice statue, which is the Pieta of the choir of the cathedral. So this Pieta is part of, uh, um, I would say, an ensemble of, of statues, which were put uh, by Louis XIV, uh, the beginning of the 
uh, 18th oh. century to uh, illustrate actually the uh, what we call the, the vow of uh, King Louis the 13th. Louis the 13th uh, in uh, 1638 he dedicated uh, the kingdom of France to the Virgin Mary um, and also he made a vow and at the end of the year he he had uh, a son, Louis XIV, and so to uh, illustrate and celebrate this uh, vow of Louis XIII, there is a wonderful uh, ensemble of uh, statues at the bottom of the choir, and, and this statue will be cleaned up and restored um, as part of this uh, restoration program that we are going uh, through. The grand organ, which uh, we uh, look at right now. So this grand organ, which is one of the uh, largest grand organs uh, in Europe with uh, more than 8,000 uh, pipes, will be also restored. It, uh, it was completely uh, dismantled um, in, the, in, the following, uh, uh, in the following of the fire. Only some very large, tall pipes uh, stay in place. So this grand organ will be also completely restored and will be uh, reinstalled in the cathedral before the uh, reopening, which is uh, targeted uh, at the end of uh, 2024, right now. Um, and this, uh, alors this, this grand organ suffered actually from uh, lead dust. So you can see that uh, this is a, a part of the problem on these pipes and suffered also from uh, something else, which is the, the watering by the firefighters, because between the, uh, the pipes themselves in the organs, you have uh, laser uh, joints, and these laser joints uh, suffered uh, a lot from the water. So all this will be uh, restored. And what we will do, uh, we will have to uh, reinstall the grand organ about six months before it can be uh, played again because the reharmonization of a grand organ like this one, which is a, a, a huge one, uh, necessitates about six months. So the, the organists and the, the specialists of uh, organs uh, are, are, are on this, uh, on this uh, type of timeline because uh, these, these are effectively, I would say, wonderful, but also very uh, sensitive uh, artworks and uh, and, and, and piece of... Uh, so of what can we hope to see when we're there in 2024 and what will not be completed? What, so, what do you think the state will be? So, so the, the target, the target uh, set by the uh, Ministry of Culture is to reopen the cathedral at the end of, uh, before the end of 2024, uh, both to uh, religious services and also uh, to visitors. Uh, what will be done at that time, if this uh, timeline is, uh, is, uh, is uh, held, uh, what we will have, we will have a new spire, uh, exactly on the model of the, the one which was on the cathedral before the fire. We will, we will have the, the timber framework of the roof. We will have the roof itself. So the structure of the cathedral, which has been destroyed, will have been uh, rebuilt and reconstructed. And we can expect also to have, um, I would say, the interior of the cathedral uh, cleaned up uh, like we saw with the chapels I, uh, I showed you a little bit before. What will not be done, what will still need to be done is the full uh, restoration of the bottom part of the cathedral. So uh, the, the, ex the exterior of the choir of the cathedral and especially the restoration of uh, these uh, wonderful uh, large flying buttresses that you that you know and that you, you see. Today, we have installed also uh, um, pieces of wood to prop up the flying buttresses. So all this will still have to be done. So we can expect uh, that the, the full restoration of the cathedral after the reopening will uh, probably last until the end of the decade and that we will need another five to six years to fully restore the cathedral. So which means that the project of reconstruction and restoration of the cathedral is a long-term project. So uh, that begs the question, there was a lot of press uh, about uh, how much money was raised and how much it's going to cost and mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, there were rumors that there was too much money and you don't need the money. Uh, <laughs> Actually, it's what is, the what is the status? So the, the status is the following. Uh, so we were uh, fortunate enough to, to effectively have uh, very large pledges from uh, French tycoons like uh, Arnaud, Pinot, Betancourt, and so on. Uh, so this is one thing. Uh, we had also a wonderful support uh, up to now from the international donors and especially from the American donors. So I take this opportunity to, to thank you very much because this is for me very uh, encouraging. Uh, so what we did up to now actually, what was funded was the safety phase, which was the first phase um, of, uh, I would say, the protection of the cathedral, which lasted until uh, mid 2021. And we spent about 170 million for this safety phase. We, um, we now get into the, the reconstruction phase, so the phase which will lead us to uh, the reopening at the end of 2024. And this, uh, this phase, so we, we do not have the full budget yet, but we believe that this will cost about 600 million because this is when we will have most of the, I would say the funds needed in this phase. And we have also an estimate for the full restoration of the cathedral, which is uh, so, so until the end of the decade, as I said, which is at about 250 million at least. So, which means that overall the, uh, the budget for the restoration will, uh, be, uh, will surpass uh, 1 billion. And so, which means that even if we have uh, pledges and we have a strong support from our uh, donors and especially American donors, we still need funds. And, um, and this is why we, we pursue this fundraising for Notre Dame and we will pursue it, I would say, uh, in the long run, as I said, because this is a long-term project. One of the things, thank you for that, uh, Michel. I'd just like to thank you. This is such an important, important uh, place. I think one of the things, you know, I've been doing this work photographing great buildings. One of the things we learned is that the building transcends geography. It transcends religion, uh, people of all faiths, uh, people of all ethnicity. Uh, we're really bound to this building. And so the work that you're doing uh, is so critical and I thank you from the bottom of my heart just as a citizen of the world uh, because it's important. Uh, for me, it's a, a very important place. I know so many people on the call, it's an important place. So a deep bow of gratitude to you for that. Thank you, thank you very much. But, and, and once more, I think my, my thank you, my personal thank you, uh, gets to the American <clears throat> donors and especially from Chicago, because as you said in the beginning, you were uh, among the first ones to react after the after the fire. I, I can tell you that I lived through uh, uh, both, I would say, a, a tragic uh, moment, and, but also a very uh, enthusiastic moment. To to um, to tell you a short story, uh, we had started to raise funds in the U.S. before the fire, but we had uh, more or less 700 donors in the US before the fire. And suddenly after the fire, there, there was an outpouring of support and I used to receive an email each time uh, I received an online donation. And in the following days, uh, I think I received something like 400 donations an hour from the US. And so my, my, my system was completely crashed. I had to change everything. And, and, and after a few days, so we had uh, something like 10,000 uh, friends and donors in the US. So this was, in a way, in this tragic situation for me, it was encouraging uh, to, to see that. And, and now we are uh, uh, something like 40,000 friends of Notre Dame de Paris. And, and I, thank, I thank you very much for that. And, and I encourage you also uh, all around this conference call to join us if you want to, uh, to, to go with us in this uh, wonderful journey. So one of your former employers, Orange, uh, supported this wonderful 
uh, virtual reality show, which I had the pleasure of visiting a couple of weeks ago in Paris. And I went kind of ambivalent. Oh, a 3D show, put the head glasses on. And well, it was absolutely remarkable. So tell us a little bit about that. It was literally yeah. like getting to walk through history. I, uh, Natalie and I walked out of there just uh, blown away by uh, how compelling it was. Yeah, no, this is something which, this is a really uh, fantastic uh, experience. This is actually something which was offered to us by uh, Orange Group. And this is um, what we call Eternel Notre Dame in, in French, which is a, a virtual reality experience, which is a, a journey in, in time and in space in, uh, in the cathedral. And so you have the opportunity to, um, to walk in the cathedral in the Middle Ages, to get up to climb up the towers during the uh, construction of the cathedral, to meet with the uh, the canons of of the chapter of the cathedral uh, downstairs, and in the end to meet with the architects and the uh, craftsmen who are working today for the construction of the cathedral. So this um, this show, Eternal Notre Dame, is uh, currently presented in Paris uh, below the Arch de la Défense, and uh, our intent is. Uh, is to bring this show or, or part of this show because we are not sure that we will be able to do it uh, exactly um, in the same pattern, but to bring it also to, uh, to, to the US and especially to Chicago or in the fall. And so I will, uh, I will let you know evidently about it as soon as we will have set up this, uh, this experience. And so if you want to join Friends of Notre Dame de Paris, so you have this very simple, so you can, you can have a look at our website at friendsofnotredamedeparis.org. So you, you will be evidently more than welcome among our friends. Merci, Tom. Merci, Michel, uh, for this amazing presentation. It is uh, so wonderful to see the progress, see the innovation. Um, my name is Emile Abej, I'm director of program, and I will just bring to you uh, some of the many questions we have on the chat line now, and uh, you can answer to the best you can. Uh, I will start with a question here. Uh, have they determined that the stones in the cathedral, especially those that remain in place, were not damaged and weakened by the fire? So maybe a question for Michel since it's quite technical. Yeah, no, so actually they, they were they were weakened by the fire. So this is uh, uh, very evidently, I would say the, the the fire on the one hand side and the watering also uh, were damageable for for the stone. So uh, part of the work uh, currently done is effectively to assess the uh, the quality of the stones and to uh, to 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 plan the replacement of the stones which are missing evidently, but also of the stones which are uh, weakened. What you need to know also um, uh, is that the, in, the, in the 19th century, when Viollet-le-Duc restored, I would say, the cathedral and transformed the cathedral, he used uh, stones which were not of the same quality as the stones of the Middle Ages. And, and, and sometimes we see stones in a, in, in a worse shape from the uh, 19th century than stones from oh. the Middle Ages. So this is, and, and we have also we have also big differences in the um, in the uh, in the, um, um, the 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 whites of the of the vowels themselves. So they are not of the same whites in the nave and in the choir, and so there are there are differences also which are due to the different uh, times of uh, building of the cathedral and and afterwards naturally. Uh, all the damages uh, resulting from the fire. Well, we hope that the new stone will be uh, of the best quality possible <laughs> to sustain the, 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 the best stones <laughs> stemmed at that time from the from Paris itself and uh, from uh, Montagne Saint Geneviève, uh, oh, where wow. uh, there were quarries of very good quality, but not always uh, in the following centuries. Uh, there is a question, I, if I can find it. Yes, I was interested by it. If, is uh, by Anne Hilbert. 
uh, is anything being done to further fireproof the cathedral? Any new innovations being incorporated? I'm sure the French innovation is at its best in this restoration, but I think that's a great question to know. Uh, are you preventing things from happening again? Yeah. So, so one very important thing is to to avoid the uh, I would say the replication of the fire. And so, what we what we will do, we will install. Uh, what's done uh, now in this type of building, which is to install uh, sprinkling systems uh, under the roof of the cathedral, which uh, basically is, uh, doesn't seem to be difficult. The difficulty being to, to bring water actually uh, uh, at the level of, of, the, of the roof of the cathedral. So this is part of what will be done. Um, uh, otherwise, so the, there, there were in the in the test in the restoration of the test chapels, so so the tested uh, restoration techniques, where you uh, you do not I would say uh, scratch the uh, the stone and and with uh, laser techniques uh, you you are able effectively to clean up and to uh, to restore the structure without I would say taking part of the stone which would be detrimental evidently. So so yes. Uh, there are many, many, uh, I would say, innovations which are put in place. Enfin, it's not always innovation, but it's new for Notre Dame that will help us uh, rebuild and restore the, the, the cathedral. Merci, Michel. Uh, there's a question about the lead that came from the stained glass, and uh, Carl Klein is wondering if they needed to be replaced since uh, I imagine it became compromised during the fire. So the, the lead holding all the stained glass together with the heat. Alors, some parts of the lead of the stained glass will, will be replaced. Uh, uh, generally speaking, we try to keep the, uh, the structure of the, of the stained glass window. So part of, part of the structure is in stone, part of the structure is in lead. So we try to keep as much as possible the existing lead, but, but some parts of them will be replaced effectively. Yeah. Now there's a question about the artistic elements of the restoration, and maybe Tom can pitch into that question as well. <laughs> um, uh, so that's a question from Eile Vandenberg. I'm sorry if I pronounced the name not right. How did they go about choosing who to redo the stained glass stone block? So which craftsmen to choose to work on these, uh, repairing these artistic elements? Um, you, you, no, go you, ahead, please. Now, I'm, I'm, I must confess, I am not a specialist of uh, the restoration of stained glass windows. So uh, what I know is that we, we, we use uh, specialized uh, companies to do it. Um, I know that there, there are specialized companies, not only in France, but also in the UK, because I know that there is a very big experience also in this area in, in the UK. Um, but but I'm, I'm afraid that I am not a specialist. I, in it. So I, I guess I can speak to it. I thought you would ah. be able to. So <clears throat> having been involved in the restoration of the Rookery and Carson Perry Scott and a lot of other buildings in Chicago in my former life uh, with Gunny Harbo, uh, there is a small universe of people uh, globally that are can work at the level of one of these masterpieces. So the selection process is extremely careful and there are people uh, in each of the trades that get uh, qualified both for expertise, who the individuals on the project will be, what they have done in the past, and then obviously uh, what their bid to uh, do the work and perform the work is. So I uh, know some of the architects involved and the process is a very diligent, uh, careful process. Well, thank you for adding to, to the answer. I'm sure the level of craftsmanship for Notre Dame needs to be at the top level while minding the budget. <laughs> like, <Yeah. even> <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. <laughs> okay, I have a very specific question here. Um, uh, is it true that the statue of patron saint of Paris, Saint Geneviève, was destroyed in the fire by Monsieur Thompson, by T.C. Thompson? The question by T.C. Thompson. No, no, actually, the um, no, no, uh, actually, we have uh, concerning Saint Geneviève. So we have the uh, 
what we call the, <clears throat> the chasse of Saint Geneviève, uh, which which was inside the castle wall, but it it will be restored, but it has not been touched uh, really by the fire, so it needed to be restored. And we have also uh, statues of the the saints of Paris, which adorn actually the the sacristy of. Uh, the cathedral, which is on the southern part of the cathedral. Uh, so you have uh, Saint Geneviève, Saint Marcel, uh, and so on, all, all the, the, the saints of Paris. And these statues, they, they, they will be restored because they were already in a very bad state uh, before the fire. So they will need to be restored. But, but there is no, uh, I would say, disappearance of a statue of Saint Geneviève uh, in the cathedral. You. <laughs> Well, the other thing you might want to uh, fill the group in on is the removal of the exterior sculptures as well, just prior. Yeah. So, so what what happened effectively uh, yeah. is that in the in the framework of the restoration of the spire before the fire, and and very exactly four four days before the fire, we had removed all the statues of the spire. Uh, from the spire. So there, there were <clears throat> in total 12 statues of apostles, very, uh, very tall statues of about three meters, and, uh, and four statues of the symbols of the uh, evangelist, what we call the tetramorph. And these 16 statues, they had been removed from the spire uh, the, the previous Thursday, I think. Uh, so these statues, they have been uh, Safeguarded. Uh, now they uh, they have been all restored in a in a specialized uh, workshop in the south of France near Périgueux, and they are presented uh, in a, in a museum um, on the Trocadéro Hill in Paris, which is a Cité de l'Architecture et du Patrimoine. So if you have the opportunity to uh, visit Paris, so go to this museum and you will see these uh, sixteen. Uh, statues uh, completely uh, restored. Uh, so they will stay there until uh, 2024 when they will be uh, reinstalled on the, uh, on the spire of the cathedral, uh, as I said, for the reopening. Another wow. one of those miraculous Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, it's miraculous. Four days before. There's, a, there's an old yeah. joke that yeah. says, how does yeah. God keep his anonymity? And, and that's yeah. 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 Okay, there's a trick question. Uh, we're coming pretty close to the end of the hour, but just a couple more questions. A trick question is, uh, what caused the fire? So we don't know. Uh, so the investigation is not uh, conclusive at this time. So there are uh, a few uh, assumptions uh, which have been made by, uh, by the investigators. So one of them would be uh, a cigarette butt. Uh, that could have caused the, uh, the spire. So I, I am not convinced about it because the, the team, because we had evidently a team of uh, workers on the, on the spire uh, during the day, but they had left already uh, uh, more than one hour before the fire uh, started. So, and there is an, another possibility, which in my view is uh, probably more realistic, which is that we had actually clocks in the transept of the cathedral, and uh, and this, these clocks were uh, feeded by uh, electrical circuits, which were very old electrical circuits. And in my in my view, this is quite possible that these electrical circuits uh, have suffered a shortcut uh, because they were in a, in a bad state. And um, and uh, and we know that the, the the fire started at the bottom of fine in the roof, but at the bottom of of the spire. So. This is this is possible that this be the reason of of the of the fire. But uh, once again, this is this is a personal uh, personal uh, assumption. So the, the police has not concluded uh, anything uh, about the, the reason of the fire of the of the fire. Sorry. So th that report will remain inconclusive, is what you're saying? Yeah. yeah I, uh, well, now it's, it's, it's inconclusive. It's... Three years after. <laughs> well, so yeah. <laughs> It, it's, it's better to move forward uh, and not to, of yeah. course, uh, have the fire, try to keep the fire at bay in the future. And that's all happening now. Uh, I have two last questions. One is about money. There was question, the estimated cost, you said, Michel Picot, uh, 
uh, 1 billion overall. Was that in euros or dollars? And is it's, in, there... it's in dollars, it's in dollars, but it will be above, above 1 billion dollars. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. uh, of course, I think the answer to the question of Juan Antonio Portillo, uh, were there any public funds used? They are public funds used from the government to the French government to help Alors, rebuild? I, <laughs> One would assume. <laughs> yeah, the response is no. Oh, uh, I, I am afraid the response is no, and the reason is that actually the, the, the decision was made uh, by the French government to effectively uh, fund this restoration of Notre Dame de Paris with private funds, and you know that there were very large uh, pledges made by uh, French uh, uh, groups or French tycoons, so this is effectively a big part of, of the funding of this restoration. And the response is no, but there is, uh, there is an addendum to my response, which is that in France, you have uh, not only Notre Dame de Paris, but you have 94 uh, cathedrals, uh, which are the property of the state, Gothic cathedrals, uh, uh, Romanesque cathedrals, and so on. And the decision was made by the French government to fund the restoration of the remaining 93 cathedrals uh, 100 percent with public funds. So, which means that there is a big, a big program, a big public program, to fund the restoration of the uh, remainder of, of the cathedrals with public funds. And this is uh, the reason why uh, the funding for Notre Dame is a private one. Only so, in you know, France. They are Only not so, in France. They are not so bad. They are not so bad <laughs> in the government. So. <laughs> They have my taxes are 75 percent <laughs> well i think on this last question i think tom uh, breached the topic already but i think it's such an interesting question to from ailey um how would you say this impacted the fire of notre dame impacted the french people so i i think it was it was a shock for for french people because uh we were used i would say to have notre dame uh in the center of the city, on this Ile de la Cité, in the center of Paris, in the center of France. So for French people, it was a shock because it was, it was part of their heritage, which suddenly was at risk. And, and certainly you, you heard about the, the immediate reaction of Parisian people who gathered on the banks of the Seine who, uh, during the night. So, so this, is, this, this is, was really a, really a terrible shock for uh, for French people. But what I, I must add, and I think uh, uh, Tom said it before, so what we immediately saw also in the following days is that actually this cathedral belongs to the world. So, you know, we had, uh, I would say, and, and, and personally I received uh, from, from everywhere in the world and, and especially from the US, we, we received, I would say, testimonies of support for the, uh, the restoration of the cathedral in for us, it was really uh, very encouraging, I would say, in this uh, terrible situation. And I think this is, if, if I may, I think this is, you know that you, you okay, this is, this is a cathedral, so this is, I would say, the, the seat of the Archbishop of Paris and so on, but it goes far beyond, I would say, uh, even the Christian, the Christian uh, community and, 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 and for us, this is really, uh, a wonderful testimony of uh, uh, universal support to, to something like uh, Notre Dame. Yeah, and it's a very, very much part of the French identity and the Parisian identity. I think every Parisian uh, keeps the cathedral in its heart. Uh, and I, I thank Tom for bringing his wonderful photography to this presentation, the one where you have all those pilgrim like people, this floor people coming in, uh, was extremely. Uh, moving uh, as is this this old project. I know it's technical, I know it's financial, but it's our, also very moving to see the cathedral coming back. We see in the background with Michel what it was before, what, what it was right after the fire, and uh, it's going to be coming anew very soon. On this, I will give uh, la parole back to uh, Mary Ellen uh, to wrap this up. I will just remind Tom and Michel to stay with us a little longer after the program is over. To, to you, Marilyn. 
Merci beaucoup, Amy. Um, so much has already been said. I want to offer um, a merci to Michel and to Tom on behalf of the Alliance Française de Chicago. Um, listening to this today, we you really gave us insight into the enormity of the task at hand, what has taken place, what remains to take place. And what is encouraging to know, I think, is that there are so many friends of Notre Dame and that it goes well beyond the borders of France. Uh, so to all of the friends of Notre Dame who are making it possible for the cathedral to return to its original splendor, we say un grand merci. And to all of you who, for being with us today, merci beaucoup. Round of applause. We've asked everybody to unmute themselves. If you want to give a big round of applause to Michel and Tom, who are both in France at this moment. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Merci beaucoup.